Welcome back to the Common Fan Podcast. Happy to have you with us as always. I am TJ Burkle alongside Matty Owens Sr. and Geoff in Lincoln. Reminder that you can find the Common Fan Podcast on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, and now Pandora, iHeartRadio, and Pocket Casts. And of course, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at common fan GBR. And of course, as always, we'd love to hear from you. So follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or send your uh, comments, smart remarks, or criticisms of G off in Lincoln to common fan GBR at gmail. Thank you. <laughs> Matthew, Jeffrey. Good evening, boys. Good evening, TJ. Good evening. Uh, guys, we are excited to be joined tonight uh, by Eric Hess, the founder, the creator and founder of Arbitrary Analytics, uh, which takes a statistical look at the Huskers, Big Ten, and more broadly, college sports. Eric, thank you so much for joining the Common Fans tonight. Oh, thanks for having me on, guys. I'm excited to talk to, talk to you guys about Nebraska football. Absolutely. Absolutely. So before we get to that, did anybody watch? So we're recording this on Tuesday night. Uh probably about t roughly 24 hours after the uh, national championship game concluded. Uh, did you guys have a chance to watch that game? Yes, did watch it. Sure did. Most of it. Yep. I got to say that was normally we sort of have it on as background noise. I sat and watched more of that game and enjoyed it more than I have in years. And I was thinking about really? it. Today, and, and I think it's because there were no sec teams in it. I Absolutely. I, I said that out loud last night with when my wife and son were watching with me. I said, this is just nice because it's not Georgia or Alabama or even yeah. or even like, you know, not even SEC team Clemson, who had been in a yeah, number of right. national championships. It's just like, it's just, it's just good different. to have. Yeah, it's good to have some at least not there's not one SEC team in the championship. I was happy with that. So, yeah, it was fresh. I don't know. I was kind of spoiled by the the playoff games before that. So. Obviously, last night's game didn't live up to quite what I wanted to see, but you know, we'll take what we can get. I hate you mean the ones on New Year's Day. Yeah, those were so yeah. good. That, like I yeah. just, yeah. I I knew that it wasn't going to live up to the hype, but I, yeah. well, I'm really, really hoping it would. It was a heck of a game until probably more than halfway through the fourth quarter, and then the the wheels yeah. kind of fell apart or the wheels fell off for Washington. But yeah, the wrong anyway, team won. Was, the wrong team won. The cheat. The cheaters won. The Michigan yeah. Astro. The Michigan Astros were victorious. Um, Does it get? But, Does it give anybody hope? Like I thought about it all night last night. Like that Michigan, they keep saying '97 was the last time they won a title. I'm like, God, and they split it with Nebraska. And I guess the only thing I kept thinking was, well, they were down and out for quite a while up until like the last six years. I mean, who's to say with the way things are going now? We get, we don't have a chance to win a national title sooner rather than later. So it kind of got me excited in a way too. It's yeah. Kind of weird. Yeah, I, I think agree. I think it should. Like we are, we are up there. We are a blue blood, a, right alongside Michigan in the pantheon of college football. And there's nothing stopping us from getting back to that point. I think the other takeaway I had was um, their formula: tough yeah. defense, running the ball, you know, throwing it when you need to. But like that formula is like the oldest thing in football, and it continues to work for teams that focus on it and commit to it and execute mm -hmm. and do it well. And so I think, you know, that's what we've all as Husker fans wanted to see since we wrote the book on it, you know, for, for decades. Um, and hopefully that's what, what Coach Rule is trying to get us back to. Eric, any thoughts on the game? Um, you know, I was rooting for Washington. I kind of like the fact that Michigan hadn't won an outright title since, what was it, 1948? 1948. Yeah. Uh, like their half credit for that 1997 one. Um, but, I mean, it's kind of cool to see, you know, Washington becoming a Big Ten team later this year. So it was a, an interconference battle. Those two teams are going to play each other again in nine months. So we'll see yeah. how they are by then. And um, I agree with the sentiment about not having any SEC teams. That was a nice change of pace. So Absolutely. Yeah. All, all Big Ten title game. It's fantastic. Um, well, Eric, you um... – Let's pivot to uh, to some of your work at Arbitrary Analytics. Um, you had an article from December that that caught our eye. Um, of course, I think the the frame of reference was, of course, uh, Dylan Riola, mm -hmm. um, who everyone is still very excited about in Husker Nation. Um, but you kind of took a broader look at college teams that have recruited 
five-star quarterbacks. Um, he went back to 2011. So 2011 through 2023, whatever the 12 or 13 year period. Um, um, just kind of curious, you know, what you, you were kind of looking, it was entitled Riola returns do five-star quarterbacks live up to the hype. Um, and so just kind of, you know, I assume your, your approach was kind of to see, you know, set the stage for what can we hope for with Riola or what's the best case scenario or what, what, have, how have other, you know, five-star QBs panned out. Um, but kind of curious what you found um, in, in your research there. And, and I thought it was a great article, but I want to let you, you know, before I dive into it, I want to let you kind of talk about it. Yeah. So definitely the one thing that really jumped out, I started this article all the way back in the spring when uh, Riola first decommitted from Ohio state. And there was some buzz that, okay, maybe he's going to, pick Nebraska at that point, ultimately, you know, he picked Georgia. Um, so um, when I started that, a big theme was, okay, how good are these teams? Because the big names are guys, is Trevor Lawrence, you know, Hunter Johnson who went to Clemson, uh, Tua, some really big name guys who are going to big name programs. So it makes sense that those teams would recruit really well, building on that success. Um, it was definitely a cause for concern about whether or not Raiola was going to come here because, and even in the spring, you know, getting to 500 was probably the goal for the 2023 season and they did fall kind of short of it. Um, so it was concerning. Is he going to pick Nebraska given that track record? Um, only two quarterbacks have picked a school with a losing record the year prior. Uh, one of those being JJ McCarthy going to Michigan after that two and four season that they had during the COVID year in 2020. So there wasn't a lot of precedent and there was only two other guys that had gone to a school who even won fewer than 60% of their game. So now it's a lot of 10, 11, 12, 13 win teams that were landing these types of quarterbacks. So that was definitely huge for Nebraska just to break that trend. Um, yeah, but yeah, I really wanted to look into how good are these guys once they actually get to campus. Yeah. Um, I was pretty surprised by their true freshman stats. I thought more of these guys would have gotten opportunities early. Um, only two of them threw for over 3,000 yards as true freshmen, Josh Rosen and Trevor Lawrence. Um, both were kind of came in as the starters, so probably a similar situation to what uh, Riola's walking into in Nebraska, although I don't even think Lawrence was the game one starter, was he? Didn't... Uh, uh, I I don't remember. I think you might be right. I think he replaced yeah. somebody. I can't remember who it was though. Yeah, I thought he came in maybe during this. I know he's played early, but yeah, I don't even think he was the week one starter for Clemson. So now these guys aren't always being handed the job right away, which I thought Purdy was going to give Raiola a pretty good battle, being more experienced. I think Purdy is a power five um, caliber of quarterback. We'll see where he ends up and how he does, but. No, I just thought that experience would have won out. Um, well, maybe not have won out, but definitely made it a QB competition worth following, probably into fall camp. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there's only, what, it was six guys that have thrown for even 2,000 yards, and there was another, I think, six guys who didn't even throw a pass. I mean, some of those are kind of oddballs, like Jameis Winston, who redshirted, played on the baseball team, and then obviously came to one Heisman at Florida State, so some unique situations there. Yeah, um, for sure. I thought it was interesting. There was a fairly large number of five-star QBs who transferred. Yeah. And that was definitely when I was working on this, you know, there was still a thought that maybe Riola ends up when I started at Ohio state, maybe Georgia. Uh, I always had hope that at some point in his career, he would end up in Nebraska. I figured that it would be a situation where he goes to Georgia is behind some other quarterback for a year. They bring in another five-star quarterback behind him, and he decides, okay, this is the time. I want to take the jump. So I thought that the transfer stats were going to work in our favor. Um, <laughs> but now it's kind of more of, all right, almost half of these guys over the last 12, 13 years have transferred. I mean, that doesn't even count. I mean, what, Malachi Nelson is in the portal after – so that just his first year at USC um, – Dante Moore at UCLA transferred. So even some new quarterbacks are already transferring. So those numbers are probably even going to be increased. Um, so while I'm very excited that Ryle was here, I 
I wish I could say I'm 100% positive he's going to stay and finish his career here, but, you know. <laughs> Don't think, do this to me. Don't do this to me. No, I think the team our... needs to improve to uh, make sure he stays here, so. Well, hopefully but. he's part of leading that improvement, right? Um, yeah. On our, on our last uh, – our last episode, we did we did some over unders and and we did one on on how many years Raiola would be here, but that was not focused on the fact that he could transfer. It was focused on whether or not he goes early to the NFL, whether you know he's here three that's, or four years. So that's what I'm mo- most hopefully, hopeful about. yeah, hopefully that's that's what we're what we're looking at in a, in a few years, or that that'd be a good problem to have, I guess, would be a way to say yes. it. I um, also thought it was interesting, so. Um, a good number of those guys ended up in the NFL and some of them were still playing in 2023. So I would imagine that that number will go up. Yeah. And in fact, I don't have the number in front of me. I tweeted it out a few weeks ago, but I think it was like 13 of these 39 players were still playing college football in 2023. So there's definitely kind of some weirdness with the extra COVID year. You have guys like Bo Nix and Spencer Rattler who, you know, you would have expected to uh, have moved on that were still playing. JT Daniels is another one was had a really long career <laughs> so i think overall in college football there was some elevated qb play this past season because these guys are so experienced they have so many starts under their belts you have some high caliber guys that you know are still playing football um dj is it you we young i always tr- struggle with i still it. don't right. understand I your guess is as good as ours <laughs> yeah. Eric. i mean you're close <laughs> yeah you're, you gotta be close so, i mean he's adding another year so he has time to you know add these career stats so, um, uh, you know, a lot of these guys were still playing. I think it was what 11 had been drafted as quarterbacks. Braxton Miller made the move to wide receiver. Um, but definitely expect Caleb Williams to probably be the number one at worst case, probably the number two pick. Um, now I'm hearing JJ McCarthy is a first rounder. I don't know if I believe that yet, yeah, but I don't know about that. Um, yeah. he's uh getting some buzz too. So that number is definitely going to increase not only this year, but over the next few years for the last 13 years of five-star quarterbacks. I see. Speaking of JJ McCarthy, I did read an article and this will be of interest to you fellas. I guess Notre Dame was really trying to get him and Tommy Reese just completely shut that down. So thanks a lot, Tommy Reese for that one. <laughs> uh, nobody cares, Louise. Jeff. Nobody cares. <laughs> so you find sure. that interesting. Yeah, yeah you're nice welcome. swing and a miss from a, from a <laughs> uh, high profile Notre Dame assistant there. Way to go, guys. Nah, nah. Well, real, uh, I mean, real, real quick here. Um, so I know, I know Jeff has a question for you, but you know, I'm just looking at your, your numbers that you put out, Eric, for the true freshman stats. I mean, even, even if Dylan is in the middle of the pack and those numbers that you have, like if he has like um, a Jacob Eason or Bo Nix type of season where he throws for 24 or 2,500 yards and the TD, to inter- the TD to interception ratio is similar to those guys, 16 and six or 16 and eight. I got to think with Nebraska's defense, that leads to a pretty good record. So um, really, really interesting and cool numbers. And I, and I love that article, Eric. Just, want, just wanted to get that in there. Oh, well, thank you. And yeah, I'm kind of hoping, yeah, that, Kind of Jacob Eason, you know, maybe Caleb Williams. I know he was behind Spencer Rattler, so his right. stats are kind of probably under undercounted for Oklahoma that season, but still a pretty eye popping TD to interception ratio that he yeah. had. I'm, you know, if Raiola can be, you know, 20 touchdowns, even 10 interceptions, which is certainly not great, but it'd be improvement over last year, <laughs> I think this team should be capable of winning eight games. Yep. That's a- Lo- love to hear yeah. that. Yeah. Um, the one question is Matt was kind of alluding to there um, with the fans, you know, drinking what we call the roulade slash Kool-Aid. <laughs> I even said that I joked on a previous podcast that Matt here isn't drinking the Kool-Aid. He's actually dumping out the powder from the packet and snorting it. That's how big <laughs> he is. On, <laughs> that's how big he is on rule um, as common fans. That's a lot of the people that listen to our podcast are just average Joe's. I'm um, looking for information about the football team. Is there any any additional information you found about Raiola that can get just the average fan pretty hyped up or super um, charged? I don't know specifically about Raiola. I've or five or five star QBs. Yeah, just in general. Yeah. I mean anything to give us positive. Not, not that he's going to transfer anything to give us hope. <laughs> <that he'll stay. laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I would say the biggest thing, and especially with the last week of college football, is if you look at Texas and Michigan, they both, you know, were kind of down programs. And probably the most famous article I've ever written was about a comparison between Texas and Nebraska. I think I wrote this in 2022 in the spring. So I don't know if you guys have seen this. Um, Fox Sports ended up tweeting out the stats comparing what Texas and Nebraska had done since the 2009 Big 12 championship game. And, you know, for, uh, I do remember seeing that. Um, yeah. So for points score points against, they're both within half a point. Uh, Texas ended up winning one more game over that span of what was it? 12 seasons in Nebraska. So they, Nebraska had 35 draft picks to Texas is 37. But kind of the one big difference between the two programs, despite all the on-field similarities, was Texas had 17 five-star recruits to Nebraska zero, and oh. Texas had 158 huh. four-stars to Nebraska 72. Wow. So, Sheesh. you know. Damning Texas, numbers. Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, Texas is obviously recruiting well. High school, football mecca of the world. But yeah. it wasn't until Quinn Ewers showed up for Texas that this turnaround really started, and they've had a great last two years. Same thing with Michigan. You now JJ McCarthy gets there. They've had a couple of great seasons with him. Nice. I see where you're going with it. So yeah. I have a lot of optimism that, you know, landing that five star quarterback to be kind of that cornerstone player is going to start to snowball some success. I mean, my hope for next year is seven to eight wins. Um, I think we're going to be favored probably in the first seven games of the schedule. Um, a lot of the tough games are at home. Um, but that back half of the schedule is pretty brutal. Yeah, uh, it's a gauntlet. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, oh. if we could start seven and zero and finish seven and five, and kind of give those vibes to Mike Riley's second year. But I think <laughs> even that is a step in the right direction, and is going to get, yeah. especially if Riola is playing well in those, you know, in the entire season, it's going to get more players excited, more recruits, transfers wanting to play with him. Um, getting Isaiah Nayer out of Texas and Wyoming was you know, a big get already. So. I think guys are going to be excited to play with Raiola if he has a good year. And, you know, 2025 is really the season that Nebraska fans should be really getting excited for. Beautiful. Love Heck it. yeah. I yep. love that. I'm, I'm ready to put some pads on and, and uh, <laughs> let's, let's do this thing. Yeah. I mean, only, it was only two or three years ago, Texas was five and seven. Mm -hmm. um, right. And so, I mean, that's a really, good that's point. a really good point. And those numbers, those numbers are shocking. Mm -hmm. um, I think it speaks to a point that, that all Husker fans probably know, and that's that, you know, the national media has always treated Texas is up there with, I'm not joking, Jeff, this is not a shot at you. They're up there mm -hmm. with Notre, Notre Dame consistently as one of the most overrated teams, even when they don't deserve it. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, honest, I'm not trying to pick a fight with you. It's always true though. Like so, there are some schools that just constantly get that benefit of the doubt, even when they don't deserve it. And Texas is the, absolutely one of them. And that's just, those are, those are fascinating numbers that you shared, Eric. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and so, I've always seen Oklahoma fans really love that analysis I did, which kind of stings because Oklahoma fans are also making fun of us, but it's <laughs> cool just to see my table randomly up here and some argument between Texas and Oklahoma fans that yeah. uh, <laughs> Texas has just been Nebraska with better recruiting for the last 12 years. But. Right. Now I got to dig for that article now because I find, I think that's fascinating that they're that, they're that close really head to head in terms of on the field. Yeah. yeah. Like I, was shocked by I think it too. further like speaks to like, I don't know if you guys had all seen, um, this is from maybe two, three years ago. Uh, Dirk Chatelain did a, a whole thing about our, how our turnover margin is by far for like the last like 20 years is like the worst turn turnover margin by far in all of college football. Um, so I think that that's got to that's got to play a part in that. Right. The fact that it doesn't yeah. seem like we like Texas has been as bad as we have over the last decade or so. But. I mean, God, I don't. That's it's got to be one of the main reasons, you know. I'm sure the recruiting is a big one, but the fact that we just cannot hang on to the dang ball, uh, um, I think, yeah, well, this, I yeah mean, it kind of gets back brutal. to 2021. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, the best three win team uh, of all yeah. time, probably. And uh, <laughs> the point differential that season is, I think, plus 60 for Nebraska, which I looked at that, and that'd be generally around a six win team. So. Wow. How much that team disappointed. Uh, I've done some stuff with, you know, expected wins, um, which is just kind of, you know, the post game win probability, I guess. And Nebraska has been consistently one of the biggest underperformers of, I think I've data for 10 years, but 
of at least the last five, they've been the most disappointing, I guess you could say. And turnovers would be a big reason why. Yeah. 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 Well, Matt, you mentioned digging up that article. You know where you can find it is arbitraryanalytics.com. That's where I'm going to go. That's where I'm going to go. go. Common fans, check out uh, arbitraryanalytics.com for that article that Eric referenced on Texas and also uh, one of the more recent ones, Riola returns. Do five star QBs live up to the hype? All right, guys, just going to read that whole thing, by the way. I read that whole thing. Hey, work today when, I should, you, that, when I should have been working. That's that's the first time you've done homework since I've known you. <laughs> <laughs> or at least. Good you know, since, yep. <laughs> anyway, um, pivoting here a little bit. And I know, Eric, you've, you've taken an interest in, in this one as well. We talked a little bit about it on the last pod, but um so it reports over the weekend from multiple news outlets that the Nebraska football staff is in talks with Dana Holgerson, former head coach at Houston, former head coach at West Virginia, uh, longtime uh, offensive coordinator slash QB type coach, well known as sort of an offensive guy. Um, the Husker staff is talking to him about a role on the staff. Now, we don't know that could be anywhere from analyst to something bigger than that. Um, I know you've done a little bit of digging on, on him, Eric, and I want to ask you about that, but first guys, um, I saw this on Twitter, um, today, Jim in Minnesota tweeted this out. It's a great follow by the way, at Huskers MN, uh, just a, just a great follow for Husker football fans. So, so check him out. But, um, he found a quote and I think he, he referenced it was posted on a poster from inside Nebraska actually found it. Um, which is the Nebraska rival site. So shout out to Zach Carpenter, friend of the program. But this is this is really fascinating. This is Matt Rule's own words about Dana Holgerson in 2017. So this was as Rule's Baylor team was getting ready to play Holgerson's West Virginia team. But just I'm going to read this entire quote, guys. This, guys, it's not super long, um, but this is Matt Rule on Holgerson before he was set to play Holgerson's West Virginia team. Quote. I think they use the whole field. They're explosive in terms of getting the ball in playmakers' hands. They see what defense you're in, and they'll violate that defense. They'll give you something that looks like, hey, this is the route. And then they'll do a double move off of it. So you have to be so disciplined in the back end, Rule said. Even when you see the route and you know what it is, you're kind of afraid to go make a play. I think the biggest thing from studying what they're doing is that they're committed to running the football. They're going to run the football. I think it's really well put together and really well designed and they have a toughness about them. End quote. Really fascinating guys, because, you know, we were excited about the Holgerson thing when we talked about it the other night, even in the context of the fact that he's an air raid guy. What I hear Matt rule saying is, uh, talking a lot about running the football the ball, and, yeah. and having a toughness about them. So that mm-hmm. is music to Husker fans ears. Um, Eric, I'm curious kind of what, what you found when you did a little digging on, on Mr. Holgerson. Yeah. So I will say it's pretty early in the process. You know, a lot of when I'm coming up with something is I see a tweet like this with some quote that I find interesting and, you know, want to start digging. Is there some truth behind this? Now, a lot of times you see something like this and okay. So it's just coach speak. You know, Matt Rule going out there and saying, oh, we think he runs the ball well, but doesn't actually believe it because um, they're traditionally an air raid kind of pass heavy team. And that's what he was with, you know, Case Keenum and Brandon Whedon at previous stops. Um, So I am starting to dive into this and I'll probably have a lot more to say and write about if Nebraska does officially bring him onto the staff in some capacity. Um, But I did just want to take a look at, you know, how often... Um, do his teams run the ball and what percentage of the yards are um, do they get from that? So I only looked at as a head coach what Holgerson did. Um, you know, he was running the ball. He runs the ball about 50-50, which kind of surprised me given the list of quarterbacks that he worked with as an OC, you know, Brandon Whedon, Graham Harrell, Case Keenum, um, most recently Clayton Toon, who jumped onto the NFL, NFL and started a game for the Cardinals this season. Um, but he gets about 36% of his team's yards from the run on about 50% of the carries. 
as a comparison over the same time period. So going back to 2011 um, through last season, Nebraska's rushed the ball 58% of the time, which also surprised me. I thought it'd be closer to 50-50 as well, especially how more and more people have called for Nebraska to be running the ball more. Um, but Nebraska's gotten about, what was it? About 47% of the yards have come from those runs. So Nebraska's definitely more run heavy um, than Dan Holgerson's teams are, which I don't think is any surprise. I also wanted to look at, you know, the places Matt Rule's been a head coach previous to Nebraska. Uh, he was also right at about 51% run to pass uh, p- called plays and also got about 37%. So it's pretty well in line with what David Holgerson tries to do, which huh. uh, I think is good to kind of have that agreement between the offensive staff. I also look at uh, what Satterfield has done as an offensive coordinator in a few stops. And, you know, he's right at 51% and also 37% of the yards have come from the rush. There's some correlation there since it overlaps with Matt Rule um, in several instances. So not overly surprising, but um, yeah, he's a lot more balanced than I was expecting um, based on his reputation and what he's done at the college football level previously. So that's one unique fact. That's interesting. And you know what, what we talked about the other night was even if he is more of a pass heavy guy that, you know, they're going to, they're going to do what coach rule wants them to do. And I think, you know, he's, a, he, he wants his team to be physical. He wants his team to run the ball. That's kind of surprising to me that coach rules record overall is, is more of a 50, 50 run to pass. Um, but I do think, um, you know, I think he's talked to, he's picked coach Osborne's brain a lot. You know, he's had a year in the Big Ten now. He understands the value of running the ball. And so I think more than anything, Coach Rule will be the one sort of hopefully dictating the big picture vision uh, for the offense. Um, But I love the idea of getting a guy like Coach Holgerson. And even if it is just as an analyst, I love the idea of getting somebody like that in to bring some fresh ideas, to give another set of eyes, obviously very experienced, obviously a lot of success on the offensive side of the ball. If we can lock him down in some form or fashion, I think that'd be huge. And another reason for optimism going into year two. Yeah. And, um, I mean, his best passing offense was uh, definitely his first one as a college head coach, the 2011 West Virginia team. He had Geno Smith. Uh, he was thrown to Stedman Bailey and Tavon Austin, who I remember oh, yeah. being great wide receivers. Uh, yeah. So that was his best passing year was his first one. But, I mean, I think Raiola is – every bit as capable as Gina Smith was. I know Gina Smith was a pretty highly regarded recruit and had some issues in the NFL and is kind of become an NFL starter again. So now my favorite, my, my favorite Gino Smith quote is they tried to write me off, but I ain't right back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, as well, a part of this, I was looking up. So I didn't look this up for sure, but I think the last Nebraska quarterback to start in the NFL was in Bruce Matheson in 1987, who I've never Holy heard of that guy. Smokes. Is that right? <laughs> that was the last one I could find quickly. Damn. Like that sports reference. So what about Scott Frost as a safety? I think that would be it. <laughs> I was, was only the, the pro football sports reference. So it was only guys who played quarterback in the NFL that they were showing me, but that's what was, I don't even know that name. Do you guys know that name? Bruce Math. Guy? What did you say it was Eric? It was Bruce, Bruce Matheson. Bruce Matheson. We have to ask actually, our like, ask our dads about that one. Yeah, my dad was on that one. That's a few. That's a few years before my my fandom started, um, or at least before you can. His remember. Wikipedia is yeah. one paragraph. So, <laughs> but yeah, looks like he was in the NFL throughout the eighties. Gotcha. Wow, good for no you, kidding. Bruce. Way to go! Yeah. Wow, it was a tenth wow. round pick in the nineteen eighty three draft. So oh, wow. I thought you were gonna say it was. I thought you were gonna say it was Vince Ferragamo. Uh, that was the second to last one. <laughs> there we go. Is, there we go. He last absolutely. started in '86. That's that, absolutely. That was gonna insane. be my guess. Was Ferragamo? So, look for the longest time, we prided ourselves on running the option and not doing things the way everyone else did them. And so we had running quarterbacks who didn't fit the NFL model, especially the NFL model in like the '80s and the '90s. You actually see a lot more a bit more of the quarterback running game in the nfl nowadays right mm-hmm. um 
but that's still just astounding. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I, I love I, one thing. That's one thing I love about what you do, Eric, is um, the stuff that you dig up is uh, is to me. It's always so interesting. I really I think it's really you yeah. know, it's, it's grounded in data but um it's kind of unique and not you know i don't think there's anybody else sort of in the in the husker media ecosystem doing quite what you're doing and so that's why it's so fascinating i loved the one we referenced it during the season i think maybe during our mid-season review guys it was um what was the one that lumped us in with air force so uh, it was like qb rushing, rushing rate QB, yeah, it was like QB rushing yards or something. <laughs> yeah. And it was a positive stat. Like it was a good stat. It was a productive oh, yeah. stat. But we were also like, you know, hopefully one of these days we'll be lumped in, you know, with the Alabamas and Ohio States of the world. You know, right. all, all due respect to the to the Patriots at the Air Force. But uh, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you not, for your service. <laughs> Thank you for your service. But hopefully we're not lumped in with their football team for too much longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eric, um, I think I think most people would like to know, um, and I we talked about this a little bit before we started recording. But can you tell us a little bit how you kind of got into this analytics business, um, and how you got how you got your start doing that, and um, and all that stuff? Um, yeah, so I was you know grew up loving sports. I'm from Lincoln, so obviously Nebraska sports. Um, always wanted to work in sports as well. Never really quite knew how I'd grow up playing Madden and NBA live and you know, loved those types of games and building teams there. So it was always a passion, oh, yeah. uh, but never really knew how to pursue it. In 2016, Nebraska started the first athletic department wide sports analytics department. I don't know if you guys remember that, um, but they did a lot of stuff with Mike Riley. Um, I thought it was, contribute help contribute to the turnaround that Mike Riley had in 2016 and a strong season that year. Um, so I decided, okay, that's what I want to do. I looked up the guy who started that. He did an undergrad degree in math at Nebraska, went back, did a master's and PhD in statistics. I'm like, okay, that's I'm gonna go to Nebraska and try to do that as well. Um, I realized once I was doing my master's, I didn't want to do a PhD anymore. <laughs> Wasn't that fun. So um <laughs> But while I was there, um, after my first year in the graduate program, I was able to work with that sports analytics department, um, which was my ultimate goal. Um, so I got to work on a couple of cool projects, one for football, baseball, a little bit of just data collection for volleyball. So it was really fun having my hand actually doing some of these projects that might affect some of the teams and hopefully get positive outcomes. Um, so... Um, it was one time during the 2018 season, a friend just texted the group chat and said, arbitrary stat of the day, Adrian Martinez is the only quarterback. I think at that point it was like 1,800 passing yards and 400 rushing yards in the country. I was like, huh, that's kind of interesting. And I'm just like, well, you know, could be good to work on my own ability to look up stats, especially if I'm going to be trying to apply for jobs. So I started arbitrary analytics just as a way to share some of those types of fun stats or work on bigger projects. Um, so it was pretty first two to three years. I'd say about two years. Didn't really have anyone following me. I think it was under a hundred followers. Wasn't until that COVID season. I did an article about holding calls and how Nebraska five games into the season was the only team whose opponents haven't been called. Um, for holding oh yeah sure and it was you, was right you started the, that you, you you were you were all in on that yeah so that was my first article that really got promoted it was uh i don't know if you've seen him on twitter awesome. he's kind of become an honorary nebraska fan he's a lawyer named dan lust he really got into nebraska athletics when those four players tried to see the big 10 he <laughs> took a lot of interest in that nebraska football and then he shared that article out to his followers um so that was kind of my first big article that a lot of people started talking about. And I still see it brought up from time to time on Twitter. Um, but it was, uh, you know, kind of funny after that game, it was, I think Purdue, we played the next week. I called for three holding penalties against us. So <laughs> yeah, I don't want to take credit for that, but. No, you so absolutely you should. should. You absolutely should. Absolutely. You got to put that in there's, your Twitter bio. There's, yeah. something, there's something we talk <laughs> about a lot, Eric, and it's the college football industrial complex. <laughs> and that is basically the powers that be in the college football world 
and and they have been aligned against Nebraska since the beginning of time. And we all know mm -hmm. this. And what you did there was expose the college football industrial complex and you helped write the ship. So they realized, okay, we have to overcorrect here. We have to start calling some holding penalties. Back off a little bit. A we got to back off a little bit while we're trying mm -hmm. to keep Nebraska down. So excellent work there. <laughs> yeah, I got to ask you, like, where do you, where do you look to even find that information about, do you go to the, just like the ESPN box score for each team for each game, or is there a quicker way to do it? Yeah. So I really started with sports reference um, and all of their great statistics that they publish. And that's still probably the first place I look for sports stats. They've got great history of that. Um, well, that's kind of an interesting story too. You know, I wanted something, I wanted to be able to get all that information quicker. So I was constantly Googling, you know, is there just a place where I can download Excel files of sports information? Um, I finally came across a link to, I use the R programming language to do 90% of my analysis. Um, I, so, none of us know what that means, but that's okay. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, so not to get too much into the weeds, but you know, with R people write their own code that helps you do some other thing. So I essentially found this project that someone was working on to collect college football data. And I started using his code to download football information faster. Um, he was pulling it from a website called collegefootballdata.com. Huh. So essentially I was using his code to get it, you know, right there and ready to analyze in whatever way I wanted. Um, that project was taken over by, you know, a bigger team of people who are also kind of in this hobbyist sports analytics community like me, um, who really brought the package to a lot of people. A lot of people use it. There's a lot of accounts for different schools or conferences that are doing a lot of the same thing that I'm doing. I was one of the first people to start it um, in this community. I think I was the 10th person in the discord of people who are doing it on Twitter back in when was that event? 2019. Um, it's grown a ton since then. That group has expanded to all sorts of other sports, college basketball, NBA. They've expanded internationally, so they're bringing cricket data out there. So it's all kind of under this umbrella called the Sports Dataverse, which is the goal of it is basically get public data for free about sports and allow people to do their own analyses. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of these people have moved on to jobs at some analytics startups, um, next gen stats being one of the bigger ones. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, it's really exploded. Ultimately the data, if I'm reporting on some of that stuff, like the holding that is ultimately sourced through ESPN, but it goes through that pipeline that I was describing, um, for me to actually use. So I'm not having to be the one sitting on there scrolling through ESPN play by play. So I can just write a few lines of code and, get all the play by play data for an entire season in 30 seconds. So wow. Makes it a lot easier. Yeah. That is cool. That's incredible. Um I'm I'm curious you mentioned kind of the the college football analytics sort of hobbyist community. Have you is Moneyball like your guys' Bible? Um <laughs> I haven't heard many people talk about it. I guess have you read it? I mean it's I've never read it. I need to read oh, wow. the actual book. I've seen the movie. I was in yeah. college when the movie came out. And I don't remember did, what year it came out. As with so many other things, the movie's great. When did that good, come out? It's, it's a good a baseball movie. Um, but the book is so much more in depth and so much better, obviously. But it basically talks about like, even I think going back to like the seventies and eighties, there were, there was this like community of guys who just like were seeped in, baseball data because you had you had decades of it going back to the 1800s and so then you know computers started to become a thing so they started like feeding it into computers mm -hmm. and basically like everybody you know scouts and teams were always paying big money for big rbi guys or big batting average guys or whatever and they put all this data into the computer and said like what do you need to create runs right what do you need to create wins essentially mm -hmm. right and they came up with what they what they decided was the two most important things for creating runs and wins were on base percentage and slugging percentage, which makes sense, right? Like how often do you get on base and how many bases do you do you get when you get on base? So um, I, I highly recommend it, but it's just I feel like 
baseball was kind of out in front on the whole sports analytics. And then it still took a while, like, you know, Theo Epstein and others um, were kind of the first to adopt, adopt uh, those, you know, sort of incorporate that into their team building tactics. And only after they showed success that everyone else start doing it. But it's fascinating. Now you see it everywhere in sports now, basically. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, when do you go for it on fourth down versus when do you punt? And right. Yeah. Then, yeah. Exactly, Jeff. Well, I've only recently realized that um, one of the big stats that I report on, and I think it's gone pretty, I mean, it's hard to even watch ESPN and see them talking about pairing like the MVP race in the NFL without bringing up EPA or expected points added. Um, it's, it was really brought on. Um, it was, a, I think, a PhD thesis a student did maybe 10 years ago, and that really brought it to light. Um and kind of it's the mainstream implementation for what I report if I ever tweet out something about EPA. I only recently learned that it was a Bengals quarterback in 1970, Virgil Carter, who uh, first wrote a paper about EPA in football. He essentially said huh. he divided the field into 10 yard chunks and said, how many points do you expect to score if you get to this point in the field? Which you know, is essentially what EPA still quantifies. Um just on a yard by yard basis with down distance, all of that, you know, how many points do you expect to get if you're at this position on the field and this down to distance? So I didn't realize that football analytics also has its roots back to the 1970s. Um, I thought it was much newer. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. That's really incredible. I'm going to jump in here, guys. We're recording this on Tuesday night. As we're recording, there's about two minutes and 40 seconds left in the Nebraska basketball game. The Huskers are currently up 12 on number one in the country, Purdue. They're up 82 to 70. All I can think about, guys, is the scene uh, from the movie Miracle where Kurt Russell playing Herb Brooks late in the game keeps saying, play your game. Play your game. <laughs> so that's what... Uh, I would love to be at Pinnacle Bank Arena tonight. Uh, I don't have the sound on, but it looks like um, there's nobody. Uh, well, okay, some people are sitting, but still, uh, I'm sure it's pretty electric there right now. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Matt, Jeff, anything else for for Eric as we wrap up here? No, I just I want to urge common fans um, that are listening. If you don't follow uh, Arbitrary Analytics on Twitter uh go do it right now because there's there's constantly something that eric puts out there that i'm like oh wow that's a fascinating stat and sometimes it helps make sense of of this weird game that we love um and why we're winning or losing so i, I encourage everyone to go follow him on twitter and go to his website i uh, agree sorry go ahead jeff thanks i was just gonna say i followed as well and um thanks eric for being here we really do appreciate having you uh, here with us this evening. You certainly didn't have to do it, especially this late at night. So we do appreciate your time too. No, uh, I appreciate coming on and being able to talk about Nebraska football. Obviously, love talking about it. So I'm glad I expanding my opportunities to not just write about it, but get to talk to you guys in person about it. So it's a, yep. it's a lot of fun to work on it. Absolutely. Well, we'd love to have you on again. Uh, common fans, that is arbitraryanalytics.com. Make sure to check it out. The Twitter handle is at Arbit, Arbit Analytics. Uh, that's at A-R-B-I-T Analytics. Um, so make sure to check it out. As we were saying earlier, it is really some of the most uh, unique and compelling content out there for Husker football fans. So um, thanks again to Eric for uh, joining the Common Fans. Uh, thanks to all the Common Fans for listening. As always, GBR for life. <laughs>